Hi, my name is Colin Lawson and I'm the founder here at Equilibrium. Just before we went on full lockdown, I put out a video there entitled Human Doings. And the idea behind it was just to explain how when we're faced with rising levels of uncertainty, that our desire to take back control um, really comes to the fore. And that can often lead to an action bias in terms of how we go out and, 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 and behave. So if you want to go and have a look at that video, it should still be on our website, so uh, please do go back and have a look if you haven't seen it already. Uh, today's I'm entitled Human Doings 2. Uh, it's very much my own musings, my own thoughts uh, about how things might develop as we move forwards. And what I want to look at is what might the new normal actually look like. So I'm going to cover off a few themes. Uh, first of all, what's the impact likely to be in terms of business? How our thinking and behaviour is going to change? What's the impact on consumption? How is consumer behaviour likely to change over the months and years ahead? What about zombie companies? What's going to happen to those? And I'll explain what I mean by those as we go through. Then I'm going to talk about distance and recency bias and how that will likely affect behaviour for a lot of us, again, over the months and years ahead. And I'm going to be finishing off on the theme of better business. Um, how are businesses going to make sure that they thrive and come out of this um, better than they actually went into it? So let's have a look at the business themes first of all. I think that throughout uh, this crisis what we are seeing is a magnification of themes that were already there. What feels to me to be happening is that timelines have been shifted dramatically. The shifts that were probably going to happen over the next decade anyway are now being condensed into a fairly short space of time. And one of the obvious ones is the retreat of globalisation. Moving into this, we already had America and China trade wars, and with everything that Trump's coming out with at the moment, uh, especially actually stating recently that the, that the virus started in a lab um, in China, then you can only think that that's going to get worse. And so the move towards globalisation that we've had um, over the last 20 years or so is probably going to start to unravel slightly. And we're seeing that come through on things like supply chains and, and last minute production, whereby if you need to get five different parts from five different countries to make your product before you can sell it, and you miss just one part because you can't get it out of that country for any reason, then you snoop because you can't sell that product. So the likelihood is that some of the supply chains are going to move back to being more local and businesses holding bigger inventories of stock than they've had in the past. And so that's going to have an impact um, potentially on profitability, potentially on pricing. Do businesses put up prices uh, and therefore have a pressure towards inflation um, as a result? And then moving very close to home, um, the NHS staff over the last decade, give or take, have had a, a, a relative pay cut of about 10% relative to inflation and or other workers. And to me, it's almost inconceivable that coming out of this, that the, they wouldn't start to demand that that pay was made back up. And that obviously can have a ripple effect onto other um, consumers, onto other employees, and um, that could actually be good for the economy, of course, because more money in people's pockets, they can then go out and spend that money. Um, and staying on the employees' themes, you've then got things like the gig workers demanding better rights, better pay, um, and the same for essential workers, that if we're going to get um, pay rises for NHS staff, do we start to see pay rises for bus drivers and tube drivers and so on and so forth? And then we've just got um, the obvious ones that are taking place at the moment, the move to digital and online. Um, the digital side of it, you know, we're seeing 85-year-olds embracing Netflix for the first time ever. Um, we're seeing most people now embracing video calls and um, online gaming and um, things like, like family quizzes that are now taking place across the country. So, you know, that's a huge theme. And in terms of online shopping, there's been a new wave of people that probably never would have shopped online have now discovered actually how easy and how convenient it really is. And so, you know, those are big themes that we've got coming through. On a smaller one, you've got the move towards shop local. Um, we're seeing local greengrocers, local butchers shops being you know, heavily supported. And surely that's a great thing rather than buying meat wrapped in plastic from your um, chain of supermarkets. So I think all of these things are going to be interesting to see how they actually develop and the impact that they have. Some of which obviously will be very positive. If you're bringing, making more things back in the UK than you were previously, that's a positive. As I said, if you end up with, with greater pay rises, it brings a housing gap um, closer together. So a lot of these are positives uh, as well as negatives. Then you've got consumption. How are consumers likely to behave? We know that in the Western world, especially in the UK and the US, we are consumer-driven economies, very much so. And so if we all choose to spend less, then that's going to have an impact. 
And I think there's going to be a lot of people out there that as a result of this are going to be wanting to pay down debt or are going to be reluctant to take on new borrowing um, as a result. And that's just that natural case of wanting to feel more secure. What if we go through this again? I don't want to have the same level of financial insecurity that I'm feeling right now. And that could also lead people to save more. But again, both of these are good long-term trends. We know that the, the, the levels of debt in the UK have been unsustainable, and we know that the savings ratio is too low. So generally speaking, uh, they're good things. On the other hand, if that affecting, say, 20% of the population, is the other 80% going to want to be spending more? Are they actually going to be wanting to spend more on experiences, to go out and enjoy things for today? So I think with a lot of these, they always have a yin and a yang side to them. Uh, this one doesn't particularly, higher taxes. Um, I think it's inconceivable that the Tories will be able to stick to their manifesto promise and not to raise income tax or national insurance. Um, certainly you'd expect the higher rate of tax to, uh, to go up. Maybe not any time soon, but certainly you know, maybe a year from now um, you can see that increasing. And obviously that then puts a pressure on um, consumer spending, especially at the top end of goods. And then you've got a theme from, from work from home, and I think this is going to be a fascinating one to see how it actually plays out. But employers have lost that ability to say it doesn't work for you to work from home in a lot of cases. And if just one out of five people, or we decided to work from home one in five days, then that actually reduces the traffic on the highways to the same levels of during the school holidays. So actually it's a positive. People are getting to work quicker. Those are working from home might be much more productive. But they're likely to spend less if you're working from home. You're not going to the petrol station. You're not going to Costa Coffee on your way in. Um, you're not buying your lunch from M&S. But on the other hand, it could lead to a boom in extensions being built for home offices, for um, garden uh, sheds and those lovely things that you can now get to work from during the week and then use at the weekend uh, for the family. So again, it's going to be interesting just to see how it develops. And then you've got this move towards a general, more simple lifestyle. Uh, it seems to be that people are enjoying the pleasures of board games and um, even down to knitting and, and all sorts of other bits and pieces that, 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 that seem to be taking place. So I think there's a, there's a big move towards a simple life as well. And it'll be interesting to see who can benefit from that um, going forward. Next one is Zombie Companies, one of my favourites. Um, so a zombie company is a company that really almost shouldn't be there. It's teetering on the brink. Um, and to me, zombies should always be killed off. Uh, if um, that happens, um, then it leaves space uh, for the rest of the industry. So let's take a look at that. Um, I read in the Sunday Times uh, recently, I think some of the um, journalism practices have been atrocious across the board. Uh, and this particular article was criticising Lloyds for not lending enough of the government-backed loan schemes that are available. And they highlighted two or three businesses that had applied for the loans and been turned down. Uh, the first one that I read uh, had a half a million turnover. I think it was a pottery business or something like that and um, they made a £1,500 loss um, last year and the year before that a £1,500 profit on a half a million pound turnover. Now, um, they were applying for an £85,000 loan um, from Lloyds and Lloyds turned them down, which apparently, according to the Sunday Times, was a complete national disgrace. And yet, to me, it's the opposite way around. Um, that company clearly could not afford to repay an £85,000 loan. And the lending criteria is very, very simple, as I understand it, is that you need to be able to afford the money that you're borrowing based upon your pre-COVID trading conditions. So that business should be allowed to fail, uh, in my opinion. And when it does fail, then other people that are selling ceramics then can take up that half a million pound demand. Because the demand hasn't gone away, the business has actually failed. And if that then takes place, the likelihood is that other companies then benefit from that market share. They actually expand. Those companies are likely to be better run. It might be that that company that's benefit, benefiting from it might already turn over three million. Turnover goes up to three and a half. Cost might only increase slightly. So actually, their profitability increases. And could productivity across the UK, one of the major issues that we've had, actually increase because the badly run businesses fail and the well-run businesses actually get to take advantage of that. And I think that could be a theme that we see developing as we go through. But for sure, banks are going to take a hit. For sure, government debt's going to take a hit, because if they're underlying 80% of those loans, then that's going to be costly um, as some of these loans um, defaulted. And then we've got distance. It's an obvious one. It takes, give or take, 21 days to build a habit. We've had far longer than that already, and this has been really strongly habit-forming. 
I was watching TV uh, last night and saw somebody reach out and shake hands. And I thought, no, that's so wrong. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, it's on TV. I'm getting shocked by people shaking hands on TV. What is going on? And so when we think about it, we're talking to Chris Brindley, um, our non-exec yesterday, who, as many of you all know, is very heavily involved in rugby. And he said he can't imagine himself going back to a packed stadium for any time soon, full stop. I've got many people telling me that they will not go out to bars and restaurants until the vaccine actually comes out there. And if only a third of people, or even if you, you could only serve a third of the people you normally can because of distancing rules, can you even afford to open your bars and restaurants, even if you're allowed to? So there's going to be some very interesting impact and probably you know, a third of bars and restaurants on the high streets uh, might not survive the other side of this. But the benefit of that, obviously, is things like delivery, uh, home delivering of restaurant quality food. Is that the way that those bars and restaurants um, actually survive going forward? But these same people are telling me that they won't go out to bars and restaurants. They're telling me that they will socialise with a limited group of their own friends who they trust and know. They're just minimising that risk. I'm not saying they're not going to socialise at all. Just let's just minimise the risk and be, uh, and be sensible. So is the market for catered dinner parties for those that can afford to pay for it actually going to increase? And obviously, you've got the, 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 the real killer one, the air travel. How many of us are going to be comfortable standing in a packed security queue and a packed passport line and getting on that tin can for a couple of hours and sharing all of that oxygen and air uh, with other fellow, fellow, fellow passengers? And then even if we run the risk of being quarantined on the other side of it, if we show any kind of ill health or raised temperature or whatever it might happen to be. And I mentioned earlier about recency bias because with all of these things there will be. Um, when we had the Manchester concert bombing, there was a recency bias where less people went to concerts for a very short space of time. Um, we saw it after 9-11 with air travel, where for the first couple of years afterwards, uh, a lot of Americans chose to drive instead because they saw the risk was, was air travel. Um, so some of this will be very short-lived. Some of it, for some people, will actually be quite long-lived. And so it will be a fundamental shift that we'll have to have a look at. But if we're not travelling abroad again, is that great for the UK because of all the money that's being spent on staycations? Um, if we're not travelling abroad and staycations are cheaper, does that help fund some of this saving, help pay down some of this debt? So can we actually get some positives um, coming out of it? We'll have to wait and see. And then you get better business. I said earlier on that I think that uh, what's happening now is just an escalation, um, a reduction in the time frame for themes that were already there. And one of the things that we've been discussing as a business in terms of our portfolios, but also just what we're seeing out there as a whole, um, is how do businesses act better? How do businesses act more responsibly? And there are many different sides to that. Um, you've got everything from board structure and remuneration, um, how many females are on the board, how many ethnic diversity, and all of those kind of things. Remuneration, obviously, in terms of the pay gap um, that exists out there. You've got climate change that I think is going to be coming more front and centre um, as we emerge from the, uh, from, from, from the virus. And then you've just got the fact that people want to identify with brands that share their own values and purpose and culture. Uh, and that was a theme that was already there beforehand. Uh, people buying from brands that they truly felt an affinity with. And I think that that will continue. And I think it should. And I think it's really important. I think we've highlighted before about the fact that the Companies Act um, instructs directors that via the law their sole responsibility is to shareholders. And we've signed a petition suggesting that that actually should be shareholders, your employees and um, your suppliers and people that you do business with as well. Um, and then you've got workers paying rights. We've already touched on that before. Um, but, you know, that, that will, I think, become uh, an increasingly important focus. And all of that, hopefully, actually leads to long-term shareholder value versus short-term shareholder gains. Because doing business good, doing business better, addressing all of those things is actually good for business. It should be that businesses come out of it stronger and better um, as a result. So there's a lot there, a um, little glimpse inside my head in terms of the kind of things that we're thinking about. Um, and I'm sorry that it's, that it's not more fact-based. It's just musings, it's just thoughts of all the things that we need to be looking at and thinking of um, as we come out of this. Uh, if you've got anything to add to that um, that you think that I've missed in terms of thoughts that are musings that are worth looking at, by all means, um, drop, drop me an email. Um, if there's anything there that you totally disagree with, then even better, definitely drop me an email. So I uh, hope uh, you enjoyed that and uh, stay safe and hope to see you all soon.